Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Max and Stacy in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. It's awesome. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Hey, if you were running a country that had an amazing, pristine rainforest, what would you do with it? Hmm. Let's think about this, Stacy. I would not chop it down and sell it for matchsticks, <laughs> as Max Kaiser's famous little video you made back in 2004 or five, uh, talking about gold. And that gold actually comes into this because uh, after this first headline, Brazil's Amazon deforestation this year, nearly the size of Puerto Rico, says agency. Destruction of the world's largest tropical rainforest totaled 563 square kilometers in November, which is more than double the area in the same month last year, according to the country's space research agency, IMPE, on Friday. That would bring total deforestation for the period from January to November to 8,934 square kilometers, 83% more than in the same period in 2018 and an area almost the size of Puerto Rico. Yeah, you know, I have an idea for Brazil, actually. They should introduce a oxygen futures market. And so countries around the world, particularly in India, places in China, that are dying from air pollution, uh, they can mitigate that risk by buying oxygen from Brazil uh, on the oxygen futures market. That alone could be a multi-billion, half a trillion dollar industry right there, uh, turning the rainforest into a recurring stream of revenue instead of just chopping it down to make fiat money. Remember, fiat money is made out of paper. So here they're just feeding the fiat money apocalypse by chopping down, actually, the lungs of the earth. There's so many ways you can turn that into a valuable asset. Chopping it down would be the stupidest. I believe it is the stupidest. And of course, as a whole, if you maintain the 100% of the, the, the area and the commodity and the resource that is the Amazon, it's worth way, 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 way more, many times more than it chopped up and sold off for parts. Um, that's not often the case. But in this case, this is the case, I believe. And they're just destroying it for no reason at all. But let's uh, move on to the general economy. And, and just a little point, by the way, uh, the next two episodes coming up of Kaiser Report will be some specials into the new year. We're going to talk to Gerald Salenti. We're going to have a double header with Michael Hudson. Uh, we're going to be staying here in the Southern Hemisphere, where it took us over 45 years, Max, to figure out that it's actually warm in the Southern Hemisphere while it's cold up north. Yeah, it's summer here. That's great. So it's just summer all year round. I love that. <laughs> So here's a tweet. Not one in 100 people know this, and it seems unbelievable, but it is correct. Since the start point was the peak of the dot-com bubble. As it turns out, printing money is better for gold than stocks. Who knew? Source, Bill Bonner. So gold is beating the S&P 500 so far for this century. This is going back to 2000, and gold has actually, actually outperformed the S&P 500. Yeah, by a huge, a huge amount. Uh, I think a the big gap. S&P is up 100%. Gold's up over 400%. That big gap is bigger than the Amazon. Yeah, it's huge. And uh, it, particularly in other currencies, like Brazil, for example, an ounce of gold was 1,000 real, I believe, at the beginning of the cycle. Now it's over 90,000, right? So in other, every other currency but the US dollar, gold has been a screaming dot-com-like success. And it's also been a success in US dollars. And uh, that's going to continue now as we enter 2021 with the beginning of the third leg of the bull market that started at that time in 2000. We've had the first two legs. The big up leg uh, peaked in 2011. Then we had kind of a move, a, a second leg, which was less dramatic. And now the third leg is the most dramatic and hyper uh, move toward uh, much higher prices. The first leg peaked here in 2005. And then the second leg peaked in 2011. And then this should be the third leg. Third legs of any bull market are always the parabolic ones. So get ready for that. Of course, this is down where uh, Gordon Brown sold all of Britain's gold. And remember, we talked about that in the last episode. Of course. Also since 2000, you can see something in the charts. And again, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causality. But one does see in charts around the world, uh, particularly for the US, that the US empire is declining since 2000. You see the rich tear away from the, the rest of the US uh, you know, citizen. The top 0.1% in particular have just run off with everything since you know, 2000, since the introduction of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act and the end of Glass-Steagall and then 9-11, uh, which allowed uh, the, the theft of trillions of dollars from the Defense Department and trillions more from the uh, Fed Reserve, like printing money for them. So you've had the kind of the decline, the beginning of the signs of the decline of the US empire. And so that gold accumulation, the gold 
the rise in gold prices is also due to other nations, as we've covered extensively over the past few years, Russia, China, other countries, Turkey, Hungary, uh, Poland's just repatriated their gold from the Bank of England. Uh, Germany repatriated their gold thanks to us from um, the New York Fed. So you're seeing these nations accumulate gold. And here's another thing we pointed out at least three or four years ago. And this is Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin was in the news. U.S. Treasury Mnuchin says, if we are not careful with sanctions, people will start using other currencies. And there's no other currency money more solid and with a great history than gold. So the paper bugs as some call them, uh, really had a moment back when Gordon Brown, the chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK, when he was that, at that role, sold off half the country's gold at around two, $250 an ounce. They actually believe that having that rolling that over into treasury bills or paper was a superior uh, idea that, of course, even if you're only getting half a percent on your paper, treasury paper, it's better than you're not getting any return on the gold. Well, since that time, we've seen actually paper go into negative rates in Europe. So their negative rates obviously are uh, less than even a zero percent rate. And the appreciation of gold against all this paper money uh, would also make that argument quite, you know, dead on arrival because it's outperforming all these other paper assets. Yeah, but as we have said, the U.S. weaponizing the dollar, weaponizing the SWIFT, SWIFT system, that that would cause alternative. You could only use that once, perhaps twice. When you use it twice, you're a goner. This thing is, uh, you're, you're not going to be able, you, people are going to come up with alternatives. Steve Mnuchin is now agreeing with us. He's obviously watching Kai's report. This is what he's been doing because he's obviously saying this publicly. When we said it, we got called like bad names. But here, Steve Mnuchin is agreeing with us. So we've been proven right on that. Uh, again, you know, Switzerland, by the way, also you have to look at that chart of gold versus S&P 500. Everybody in the mainstream media thinks you know, Switzerland is so genius to sell all their gold. They've sold a lot of their gold. And what have they been doing? Buying S&P 500, essentially. They've been buying stocks. And as you see, they would have been better holding on to gold. And here's a tweet. The Fed is printing money like it's in the depth of the global financial crisis. It's dealing with a repo liquidity crisis like 2008, but mystified as to the cause. The Fed's panic at this point in the economic cycle may hasten the unwinding of the imbalances it's so desperate to maintain. Hashtag got gold. That's the Fed balance sheet, and it's increasing at the fastest pace since the financial crisis. As you know, they announced uh, something like $450, $460 billion in new repo action over the last two weeks of the year. I don't understand uh, how they can say they are mystified uh, why the repo market is flashing these, these signals of distress. Um, first of all, you would think that they have a handle on how these systems work and how they are implemented, and to suggest that they are not sure how they work or how they are implemented seems like a bit of a problem, number one. Number two, uh, I don't think there really is a mystical reason why the, um, as you point out, all the liquid assets are being pilfered, are being siphoned out of the system. So on the short term front, there, there's nothing there uh, because they're being siloed. They're being siphoned off and put into assets elsewhere offshore or in illiquid assets like $200 million of flats in, in, in New York, or there's a $150 million house that was just bought by uh, Rupert Murdoch's son in Los Angeles. So that money is now dead money. It's dead now for, for 100 years. It's never going to move from that. Well, one should never fight the Fed, and that's what he, they've trained certainly a certain class of people living in New York City and Los Angeles. Looks like QE is more likely to help the financial markets than the real economy. Germany's benchmark index, DEX, hit almost a fresh all-time high this week, shy just 200 points from record, despite another profit warning from Henkel as ECB balance sheet hit fresh record this week at 4.7 trillion euros. So the real economy of Germany, which is a manufacturing powerhouse, which is an industrial powerhouse, and a you know very uh, huge creditor nation, their economy in the real economy is definitely slowing, but their markets keep on a tear. They just keep soaring. And it just matches exactly money printing from the ECB and money printing from the Fed. Well, this is uh, profitless prosperity, right? There, you don't need, companies don't need to show a profit for the stock price to go higher. And um, so they're taking full advantage of that. They are simply allowing the environment of a higher stock price, which of course means higher options price, which of 
course, means higher compensation packages for executives, which, of course, means a greater transference of wealth to the upper one-tenth of one percent to continue unabated. Why would they stop that? Even though the companies themselves are not, or the profits are shrinking, and probably a lot of them, if you adjust it for stock buybacks, are making no money at all. Here is another don't fight the Fed headline, this money printing that's ongoing. And yet, um, you know, we started with the uh, gold outperforming the S&P 500 over the last 20 years. Uh, but here is the Fed trying to prop it up. In fact, the Boston Fed chair, Rosengren, just recently said that the Fed's going to basically stop, ignore inflation, and they're just going to focus on asset prices. That's now part of their mandate. So this is their intention. They're successful. So they could actually say, well, we're successful at maintaining property prices and equity prices. Those are we're keeping up. So we're successful because we can't figure out how to manage the rest of the economy. But we're, we're managing to prop up these prices. Here is Good Morning from Germany, where housing boom continues despite political interventions. Europace German New Homes House price index hit fresh all-time high in tandem with record ACB balance sheet. Over past decade, average house prices have risen by 70% in Germany, equivalent to an annual return of 5.5%. Right. I, I don't understand that statement because they're saying, oh, we're going to focus on asset prices now. But that's been uh, the only thing they've been focusing on for 20 years, asset prices. It's not new now. This is all their, their policy, according to central bankers, whether it's Alan Greenspan or, or whomever, has been to make an artificial rise in property and stocks their mandate. The sacrificial lamb that must be sacrificed on the altar of giving hedge fund managers chateaus in Manhattan are wages, right? They, they should say, we're going to focus on wages because that's what's been lagging behind asset prices. To say that we're going to focus on asset prices after we've left wages behind for 20 years is putting the cart before the horse. It's the complete opposite of the reality of the situation, what they should be doing. Well, Max, they do focus on, that's what they mean in inflation numbers. Inflation, they don't care about the inflation in property prices. They don't care about the inflation in all the real services you need, like health care, rental, property prices. Um, education prices, car, all the, all the things you need to get around in life and have a job and participate in the economy, they don't care about that inflation. The only inflation that the Fed ever is concerned about is what the, their oligarchs they represent worry about, and that's in the, the ordinary peasant, the bottom 99.9%. Should they ever increase their wage demands, that will cause inf the interest rates to go up to 20% again, like under tall Paul. But in fact, here's Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank says the price of health insurance is currently growing at an annual rate of 20%. That's inflation that they should want to stop, right? But they're not. This is what they want because, of course, they're member banks of the Federal Reserve, the JP Morgans, the Goldman Sachs, the Bank of America, the Citibank, all of those banks, they own this is them, fire economy, the, fi the finance, in insurance, and real estate. That's what they want going up. They want the rest of the economy going down. So even more relative to them, they're growing even bigger. Well, that's another way to lie about wages is to say, well, wages, when you look at it in terms of inflation. So if you understate inflation by seven or eight per point, mm -hmm. uh, then you can say, well, wages are keeping up with inflation. You see, and that we're doing our job. But if they were to state the true rate of inflation of eight, nine percent, you need r uh, wages to rise eight or nine percent annually. Sure. But it's not going to happen. Great. Well, we're taking a break. When we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to return to our conversation with Robert Wilson. He's a private equity investor. He's lived in Rio for over 20 years. Robert, welcome back. Glad to be here. This gorgeous out the window here. What area of Rio is this? This is Uruca. This is um, a residential neighborhood, primarily. But it's also a neighborhood that has the federal, a portion of the Federal University of Brazil, I mean, of Rio, is, is here, too. Somebody at the studio said a two-bed, two-bath place here is about $800. Is that correct? That's, that... that's about right. But that's also very expensive for Brazil. Right. Let's uh, dig into some uh, more of these interesting uh, data points in uh, Brazilian economy. The, let's talk about immigration. Whenever you travel around the world, in many cities like London, Miami, Buenos Aires, you find many Brazilians. Uh, why do they not have a similar influx of immigrants here? Should they encourage that? 
First, I think, yes, they should encourage it. Um, two, it's not encouraged because it's not part of a politics that centers on the idea of transforming Brazil and Rio into a technology and science juggernaut. And I think that really is the future that the country needs to focus on, amongst other things, obviously. But I think technology and science is the key to the future for the country. Um, and part of that issue is immigration. I mean, there's a study, you, you may have heard about this, there's a study out of UC Berkeley that looked at startups in the Silicon Valley from 1995 to 2010. And of all the startup companies they looked at, over 51% were started by immigrant founders. So if you don't have immigrants, even in the United States, the Silicon Valley doesn't exist. So immigration is a key to transforming any nation. Uh, Israel is also a perfect example. I mean, Israel is, despite the fact that you say, oh, it's, it's Jewish, it's a Jewish religion, but the fact of the matter is, it's a multicultural approach to technology and science in Israel. People from all over the world have come to Israel to create Israel. I think we can do that here. I think we can get people from all over the world to come here and transform this country and this city in particular into a juggernaut for the grand challenges facing mankind and the planet that have to do the with The grand technology. challenges facing mankind and the planet. That's exactly wow, right. that's pretty uh, big and noble aspiration. You know, <clears throat> is the pro part of the problem one of, let's call it laziness? In other words, uh, you can always make a buck, just chop down more rainforest, which is relatively easy to do, and there's a big demand for that wood. Most people think of Brazil, they think of the Amazon deforestation has expanded rapidly over the years. Should the forest be chopped down and sold for toothpicks? It doesn't make sense environmentally. What about economically? It doesn't make sense economically either. It's a one-time shot that will go away, and there's, be, there's basically no benefit. Um, we don't need more land for farming. We don't need more land for crop growth. Brazil has plenty of land for that. As a matter of fact, it's not even you know, fully br built out in terms of agriculture and infrastructure. They don't need the Amazon rainforest to do that. The rainforest is much more valuable as long as it remains untouched. Um, and that's part of the challenge. I mean, obviously, we have people here who don't believe in climate change these days running things. So it's, it's something that has to be negotiated, and, con and you have to convince and educate people that there's more value there. So wait, you're saying there's plenty of arable land without, without deforestation, right? So Absolutely. What's the, was it, why, why do it then? I think there's a, a bit of a monkey see, monkey do mentality with respect to Brazil as a developing country versus, let's say, the United States or Europe as developed regions. I think there's an assumption that says, well, they devastated their rainforests or their old growth forests. We need to do the same thing. And obviously, that's not the case. Um, it's just like, you know, the scenario that everybody talks about the, you know, the carbon footprint globally. And the only two real solutions that are proponent are wind power and possibly nuclear. And I guess there's a third, which is solar. But those three are a limited bunch of options. There are other options out there besides those three. And I think that that, that genre of basically breaking down barriers that have been ex imposed in Brazil for years and just opening Brazil up to the rest of the world is the key to the country's future. I don't think you can do that nationwide. But I think you can do that within the small context of a state like the state of Rio which has about a million, about 17 million people in the state, or 11 million people in the metropolitan area here. That's, you know, a little bit geographically, about the size of Israel. So you're saying it's inertia? I think it's inertia. From, now, the natural resources here in the country, from what I understand, are worth $21 trillion or so. It's a tr $2 trillion economy. Uh, to break that inertia, what about proposing something like, you know, potentially pharmaceuticals that can be developed from rainforests can be monetized and sold at much higher margins and profits in the pharmaceutical industry. It makes more sense to preserve this as an asset. You could sell forward $20 trillion worth of assets as a private equity guy. You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. You can sell forward. You can get a bond offer. Let's raise a trillion dollars in future pharmaceuticals pharmaceutical fund based on research in the rainforest, and you're going to take 10, 15 years worth of profits from cutting these trees down, put them in your pocket today, and use that to jumpstart the infrastructure. Why not something like that? That is not something that people here think about. Why not? Darn it! My theory is, is that interest rates in Brazil have been so high for so long, which has created a short-term window of consciousness. People only think short-term. And because of that, we have not thought about the future. Everything is the next six months, the next year at the max. But if you think long term, there's no question about the fact that the Amazon 
and other biodiversity regions in Brazil, because there are more than the Amazon is available, are huge opportunities for the country. And that's where the country needs to be focused. The country needs to be focused on its own new green deal for the country. That's where the future of Brazil should be. We talked about China in the re previous episode. We can drill down a little bit more into that. Um, is it more or less important than with the U.S. or is most trade with the other South American nations? So how does China stack up with trade in other South American nations, which is more? And how would you characterize the difference between Brazil and Argentina? Because we've been in both places now. We've been doing oh, shows wow. in both places. Shoot, which one do you want to do first? Let's do the well, second let's, one. Let's, uh, we, can, we, can, we can deal with China first. I, okay. mean, I think that there's no question about the fact that the... The meat and potatoes for China today is Brazil. Um, so in terms of the amount of effort the Chinese government is, is foisting on the region, the vast majority of that effort is going toward Brazil, and for obvious reasons, because Brazil is the big gorilla in terms of economic growth potential. Uh, and, and agriculture, because and agriculture. they have trouble now Ac with and, and also natural resources. I mean, the iron ore company here, Vale, which has had problems recently in terms of share price, but Vale was actually created um, post-World War II to export raw materials to Japan. That's what its purpose was. And so it has obviously become a global behemoth in the process. But China, of course, took huge advantage of that iron, iron, that iron ore capacity uh, in the late 90s and into the 2000s. And so it's, it's now grown, as you know, to become a real power. The, the, one of the challenges is how, what happens to countries like Korea and China 30 years ago. Look at where they were 30 years ago, where they are today. And look at where Brazil was 30 years and where it is today. There's a huge gap. So I think that gap is in part infrastructure, but it's also in part mental. There's a psychological barrier in Brazil to that kind of change. And I think the real challenge here is Brazil needs to make a decision either to be a follower, which it's always done, it's always been a follower, or be a leader. And if it's going to be a leader, it has to have some dramatic and radical change. Right. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the, just linguistically in uh, Portuguese, uh, they have a distinction between um, the arrogance of the <laughs> ordinary person and the arrogance that is associated with the old uh, monarchs that right. used to be around this place. Right. I don't know the details of this it's anecdotal. It's called suberba. 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 And what is that? Suberba is the arrogance of kings. And how does that relate to the economy of Brazil right now? Well, it's an interesting scenario. I mean, as you, you may know, that the, um, Brazil was a Portuguese colony. And actually what happened is that Napoleon, uh, his European aggression was so extent that the royal court in Portugal moved in exile to Brazil. The only way they could really manage Brazil because of its size was to create what amounted to be fiefdoms um, that were basically parceled out to the court, the monarch's court. That basically set the stage for what we have today. I and mean, we have a country that basically is run by oligarchs. Um, the debate here between the left and the right is really a false debate. It doesn't make a difference who's in power politically. If it's the left or the right, the oligarchs still run the show. And I think that's the challenge that this country is facing. I mean, it, the question is, how do you open the country up when, in fact, the oligarchs that control the country don't want the country to be opened. I noticed that uh, in social media statistics, Brazil ranks, I think, in the top three of the most yeah. um, social, social media, chatty, blogging, It's really amazing. Talking. It's hard to understand. I know that the Arab Spring, going back a few years now, was called at that time the Facebook Revolution. It was right. driven by social media, which bypassed the, the oligarchs at that time. Exactly. I mean, is there a potential for something like that here? Well, there's an argument that says that happened in the last election, um, but in a way that is different than, say, what happened with Obama. Now, Obama was kind of the first digital com you know, candidate. Um, Bolsonaro was a digital candidate. Um, and in, in some sense, his message, which was, you know, basically uh, do away with socialism, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure where the so social, Brazil's never had socialism, not even close. Um, the oligarchs made more money under Lula than they're making under Bolsonaro. There's no question about that. But I think that the question now is, how can technology play a role to, in some sense, buffer the power that the, the centralized 1% of the population has 
over the other 99%. I mean, 95% of Brazilians make less than $50,000 a year. If you let that stat register, it really makes you realize that the wealth creation potential of the country is off the charts. It's just a question of structure and, and doing away with bureaucracy. And of course, the current government under Paulo Guedes in terms of economic leadership, they're trying to use you know, a digital approach to downsize the bureaucracy. But it's going to take more than that. That sounds all very uh, fascinating. Um, I think, do, are you hopeful? We have about 10 seconds. Are you hopeful for the next five, 10 years? I'm very hopeful. I mean, I'm trying to raise a VC fund now to take advantage of the, the current situation. And where's the hot area for that? I think it's biotech. Biotech. Clean energy. OK, cool. I mean, obviously, there's crossover with digital. All right. We'll keep tabs on that. Robert, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. My pleasure. Right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Robert Wilson. If you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.